Our next example is another double summation, this one just a little bit more symbolically messy than the previous. So jumping right into it, we write t of n is the runtime, so the reader knows. And we're going to write t of n as a triple summation, the sum from i equals 1 to n of the sum from j equals 1 to i squared of the sum from k equals 1 to i times j times c of, sorry, not times c, of c. I guess this is an important distinction to make with my own misspeaking there. The thing inside of the summation is not multiplied by the summations. It is the thing you are adding up. The summations aren't necessarily multiplying anything. They're an operation, similar to like plus doesn't multiply a number. It's just an operation that occurs. So just as we saw before, we start by checking what is the summation index. In this case, it's k. k does not appear inside of the innermost summation. So we begin by simplifying the inner summation. We have the sum from 1 to n and the sum from 1 to i squared remaining entirely untouched. Then the inner summation, we do the inside times the top bound minus the bottom bound plus 1. Just as we've seen a couple of times now, that's just going to be the top bound because our summation starts at 1. So cij. And now we come to a bit of a fracturing point where deciding what to do next is not necessarily obvious because we can see j is the summation index and appears inside, but there's also an i. And this one will become symbolically messier than our previous example. For that reason, I'm going to start to bound this. Really, bounding is almost always preferred for these types of problems because the size of the exponents grows very quickly and the complexity of those expressions becomes very non-obvious of what you could do with them. So we're going to start bounding this. So let's bound it above. So we need to bound above. Bound. Above. And we need to take that summation that we had before. Let's duplicate that. We're going to do the exact same thing, but in red, and then maybe delete the highlight. And save ourselves some time. So we can now bound this. The thing to keep track of, just like when we were using formulas, is what variable is the innermost variable. In this case, it is j. So to bound this above, we're going to do nothing to i, leave that going from 1 to n, and then j, we're going to leave the bounds of the sum untouched for now. We notice this is an increasing function of j. As j gets bigger, the sum and gets larger. Therefore, to bound it above, we replace j with the largest value that it obtains on that interval. The largest value j obtains on that interval is going to be i squared, so we replace j with i squared, so this is ci times i squared. And now, the reason that this is helpful is j is now no longer in the summation. For all intents and purposes, ci times i squared is a fixed quantity. So we can now take the sum and, ci times i squared, and multiply by the number of terms in the summation. So this is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n of the number of terms, which is i squared, times the sum and, which I can simplify and write as ci cubed. Just right on sanity, let's collect, collect together some like terms. That's the sum from 1 to n of ci to the fifth. And we don't have a nice formula for i to the fifth. One exists if you want to look it up. I would not recommend it. They get increasingly messy as the power of i gets bigger. They exist for any integer i, but become very tedious to write down. So let's bound this above. We bound it above by replacing i with the largest value it obtains in the interval. We do that because this is an increasing function of i, so we replace i with n, and now we've removed i from the summation, so for all intents and purposes, c n to the fifth is a fixed quantity so far as the summation is concerned. Therefore, we can take the sum and, the thing inside of the summation, and multiply by the number of terms in the summation. So this is equal to n times c n to the fifth. Therefore, if we look at what we did here, we bounded it above by n times n to the fifth, we end the constant out front. So this is in big O of n to the sixth. So I need to bound it below and somehow get it to be in big omega of n to the sixth. So let's get to that. To bound the summation from below, I have an entirely new page here that I created for myself just so we have enough room for sure. So we need to bound that below. And for my own sanity, I also copied the expression we had from before. So let's paste that in for ourselves. And now we need to bound this below. Our technique for bounding below involves splitting a summation in half and keeping the larger half. So this is equal to the sum 
from i equals 1 to n of a big old mess. The first summation is going to be the sum from j equals 1 to i squared divided by 2 of c i j plus the sum from j equals i squared divided by 2 plus 1 to i squared of c i j. And then we bound that below by dropping the smaller half. The smaller half in this case being the first half because it is an increasing sum. So this is the sum from i equals 1 to n of the, only the second summation I'm keeping. So it's just going to be the sum from j equals i squared over 2 plus 1 to i squared of cij. It is very common to skip that intermediary step, the step here because it is often symbolically messy to write down. So oftentimes people will go from this double summation to this other double summation and skip the intervening step. Please feel free to do that. That is a very valid thing to do to cut down on your total amount of writing you need to do. So now we can replace J with the smallest value within that range. So we keep the I summation untouched and the J summation's bounds untouched. And then we're going to replace J with Theoretically, we should replace it with the bottom bound, but why not replace it with just i squared over 2 to save ourselves some pain? And now, just as we saw with our bound above, we've eliminated j from the summation, so we can take the sum and and multiply by the number of terms in the summation. So this is equal to now the sum from i equals 1 to n of the top bound, which is i squared, minus the bottom bound, which is i squared over 2 plus 1, plus 1 times the thing inside of the summation, which is ci cubed over 2. And now I just need to simplify this expression. This is equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n. Just as we've seen many times, i squared minus i squared over 2 gives me i squared over 2. And the plus 1 and minus 1 cancel, so this is times ci cubed over 2. And just to make sure people understand what's happening, I had to write that down. I'm going to combine this into one expression so that I have enough space here and don't need to sort of do 5,000 steps of algebra all written out. I'm going to combine i squared over 2 and i cubed over 2 into i to the fifth over 4. So let's do that really quick. I'm going to, in that same step, update this to be i to the fifth over 4. So doing several steps at once. Feel free to show as many steps as you want, but part of the act of getting good at these sort of things is to uh, cut down on the number of steps that you need to do. So we need to not now bound below again. Just as I said before, we can theoretically cut out that middle step of splitting the summation in half and just write this as n over 2 plus 1 to n. An alternative reason to justify this is you can always, 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 always when bounding a summation below, shrink the range of values. If I decrease the upper bound or increase the lower bound, that means I'm adding up fewer values. If everything is positive, that's definitely a smaller summation. Similarly, when bounding above, you can always increase the range of values. So if you changed it from 1 to n to 1 to n squared, that is a bigger sum. You are adding up more things. Therefore, you could always do that when bounding above. That is sometimes useful. We will see that very briefly at the end, but it is a same thing we are doing here. We are shrinking from 1 to n over 2 plus 1 on the bottom bound and leaving the top bound as n. And in the same step, let's plug in the value of i that we want to plug in, which is n over 2 to the fifth divided by 4. And now we no longer have an i inside of the summation. We have some horrifying mess. So this is equal to the number of terms, just as we saw up here, the number of terms are going to be the top bound minus the bottom bound plus one. However, we specifically set up our technique such that everything cancels out nicely. Therefore, the number of terms will be n over two. I do not need to do that algebra. It was on purpose that it is n over two. So we have n over two times that inside, it's a bit of a mess. So this is cn to the fifth divided by two to the fifth divided by four. I can collect together some like terms here if I want, I guess, and write this as c n to the sixth, and then a whole bunch of powers of two. Two to the fifth, two to the two, and two to the one. That's a big old two to the eight that we have. And I don't care what that number is. It's two to the eight. I can compute it if I wanted. It's 256, but doesn't really matter to us. So we have a number, c over two to the eight, times n to the sixth, and 
in our upper bound, we had a number times end of the sixth. Therefore, we have that is an omega of end of the sixth, which, as you can probably tell by the fact that I had to zoom out here, is usually a more complicated process. We have that it is an O of end of the sixth and omega of end of the sixth. Therefore, it must be in theta of end of the sixth. So let's tell the reader as much. So since T of n is in O of end of the sixth, and you can actually simplify this as intersect omega end of the sixth to simplify what we've said, we know T of n is in theta of end of the sixth. So cutting down on our total amount of writing by using our set notation to save ourselves some pain. Some people might argue you should use some brackets here or parentheses to simplify that. That is one set. However, the intersection operation sort of implies that automatically, so I will not do so. Notice how bounding in this can quickly sort of get out of hand in terms of the size of the constants. It is very smart to not do the arithmetic. Just leave it as exponents. If you have 3 to the 3rd times 2 to the 7th, you don't care what that number is. The actual value of the number is irrelevant to you. So feel free to leave things as unsimplified as possible. I could have left this as 2 times 2 to the 5th times 4, and it is as equally valuable as 2 to the 8th, because I don't care about that value. The point is it is a number. I don't care what the number is in particular. Notice that bounding below was way worse here. That is often the case. However, it is sometimes the case that you cannot avoid bounding below and have to do so. So we chose to do it here on our next example. We will see that we have no choice.